So the title of today's lesson is Jesus Heals the Centurion Servant. We're going to come out of the book of Luke, chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Uh, hopefully this is a familiar passage of scripture. Uh, if it's less familiar to you, prayerfully by the end of the lesson, uh, you'll feel very comfortable with the details and the information. I assure you, this is just a remarkable uh, story and account of Jesus performing a healing. There are several principles that we can glean from this passage that we can readily apply to our walk with God and certainly strengthen our walk with God. So we're just going to be careful to kind of identify those different principles and kind of point them out to really enhance this conversation. So uh, starting off with just the book of Luke itself, it was uh, clearly authored by Luke. Luke also authored the book of Acts. Um, if you look in Colossians chapter 4, verse 14, Paul refers to Luke as a physician. So if you've ever heard people say that Luke was a physician or they say something like he was really detailed because he was a doctor or whatever, um, <laughs> that's because of Colossians 4 and 14. Um, but I think what's more interesting than that is also in Colossians chapter 4, really verses 10 through 14, Paul talks about several people that served in ministry with him. He gave several names. Uh, and some of the names he listed, he said, were of the circumcision. So clearly those people that he listed that were of the circumcision were Jews. Well, Luke was not one of those people. Luke was listed after the people that were identified as Jews. So what we're able to conclude from Colossians 4, Luke was a Gentile. And I think that that's important. I think that that's amazing because uh, Luke wrote the book of Luke and Acts, but he's the only New Testament author that was a Gentile. All the rest of the authors in the New Testament uh, were Jews. And you can kind of just conclude from that that, Paul, that Luke's ambition with his gospel was to show that Jesus was not just a savior to the Jews, but he was a savior to the Gentiles as well. As a matter of fact, the story that we're going to discuss today about the centurion soldier is about a Gentile that Jesus uh, not only had interactions with, but Jesus certainly performed a miracle and just displayed uh, an amazing amount of love and compassion uh, for their situation. So let's dive right into today's lesson and let's see what God has for us. Now, when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. So as we are opening with the uh, seventh chapter of the book of Luke, Jesus had just completed the teachings and the Sermon on the Mount. So when it says in verse number one that he had ended all his sayings, uh, that is referring to the, to the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus had left the city of Nazareth and he was making his way into the city of Capernaum. Jesus already had great, massive following, and uh, he took the time to teach and to just give some instruction as he was making his way into the city. Once he completed those teachings, he fully made his way into the city, and that's when we're seeing some of the events that we're reading about in the seventh chapter of Luke. I think it's important to note that at this point in history, biblical Palestine is under Roman control. Uh, that's going to give us an idea of what the climate is at this time. You know, there were several major empires that controlled this territory, you know, going back to the Assyrians and the Babylonians and then the Persians and then the Greeks. Now the Romans, uh, the Roman Empire, arguably one of the greatest empires that ever existed, arguably. It lasted well over a thousand years. Um, and we all know that the backbone of the Roman Empire was their military. It was their army. Every great country, every great empire is established and defended by a military presence. Um, and that's one of the things that we're seeing, even in today's lesson, we're seeing a Roman military presence. You know, I, I think we also kind of want to point out the fact that there was uh, a military outpost in this direct city. It's also evident that the emperor of Rome was concerned about insurrection in this territory. You know, areas that were, you know, more docile, more peaceful, they, did, they didn't need military presence. They didn't need military defense. So because we're seeing these Roman soldiers here, we know that based on the history, 
dealing with the Jews and just based on the personality and the experiences, Jews were prone to revolt. So he was there to control uh, what was going on. So um, these were pretty hostile times. You know, if the Roman Empire controlled this area, we know that they were they were levying levying taxes, you know, and that was um, that was a burden to this area. So they, they were, we're dealing with pretty hostile towns and hostile times and hostile relations. So um, I think that that just kind of gives a very healthy background to what's going on. And it really adds to the miraculous uh, 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 events that we're going to read about in Jesus just showing love and compassion uh, towards the centurion soldier because there was a lot of hostility uh, going on at that time. And a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. All right, so in verse two, uh, we see the character of the centurion soldier. And we're just gonna take a moment and define uh, what was a centurion soldier? By definition, they were a Roman officer that commanded a unit up to 100 soldiers. Uh, if you look at kind of the full breakdown of a, uh, the Roman military, the individual soldier was referred to as a legionnaire. Then you took eight legionnaires and you created what was called a contubernium. Uh, if you took 10 contuberniums, that made up a century. Now, if you're doing the math on this, that's about 80, and that's common knowledge that roughly about 80 to 100 soldiers made up a, a centurion or a century, if you will, and the centurion soldier was over that, that century. Uh, comes from a Latin word uh, that's centuria. It's from the same uh, Latin word that we get the word century, which means 100 years. Um, but that's, that's kind of the, the logic there. Uh, if you had six centuries, which would be anywhere from 480 to 600 soldiers, that made a, a cohort and then when you had 10 cohorts, anywhere from 4,800 to 6,000 legionnaires, that made up a legion, which was the, which was the biggest unit of, of military personnel in the Roman army. And I think that it's kind of always interesting to, to mention here that when Jesus was in the graveyard and he encountered the man that was demon possessed, he said, my name is Legion for we are many, you know, and that's, that's the man saying, I don't have one demonic spirit, two demonic spirits. He's saying, I have thousands of demonic spirits, legion on the inside of me. You know, we've said it before, and we're going to continue to say it. The enemy's goal is to take you out. He is not playing for keeps. You know, uh, he's not coming to just send one demonic presence in your life. His name is Legion, <laughs> and that that is that is his intent. We gotta stay prayed up as believers. So, the centurion soldier um, in in scripture was always hallmarked in a positive way. Believe it or not, even though we talked about how uh, the, you know the Roman presence in biblical Palestine was particularly hostile. Um, if you read about centurions all throughout scripture, uh, they were always painted in, in a positive light. So we've got our story today. Uh, we're talking about the centurion soldier and the servant. But if you go in Matthew 20, chapter 27, verse 54, there was a centurion soldier at the death of Jesus. And he acknowledged Jesus as the son of God. In Acts chapter 10, we've got the very uh, notable character of Cornelius, uh, who is regarded as the first Gentile convert of the new church, he was a centurion. And then if you go on in, uh, in the latter parts of the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 22, uh, really through 27, there were several centurions that were instrumental uh, in how Paul was handled. You know, uh, you know, even though we know that Paul was ultimately uh, executed, uh, the centurion soldiers always handled him with care. They always handled him with respect. Uh, one centurion um, was the one that recognized that Paul was a Roman citizen, and that helped prevent at least Paul from being beat at that time. There was another centurion that was placed uh, over Paul's care as he was being transferred you know, from uh, the city of Jerusalem to Rome to be tried, took excellent care of them. Paul shipwrecked. There was a centurion soldier there that, that took care of Paul. So uh, they're always spoken of very well uh, in scripture, which I think is, is, is kind of worthy of note. 
Uh, so in today's lesson, the centurion soldier has a particular amount of consideration for his servant, which is which is absolutely remarkable. You know, the scripture says servant here, but it would really be better, you know, for us to picture in our minds this person as a slave. They 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 really didn't have any rights, you know. Um, and for all intent and purposes, a servant or a slave in this time in history was considered a, a piece of equipment. They were considered a tool. They were considered an animal. In other words, they were disposable. You know, um, a person who had a servant or had a slave did not have to answer for how they treated them. And if they deemed it, you know, that they wanted to just kill it and get, get rid of them, they were in their rights to do that and no one would have questioned it. So the fact that this centurion soldier just had remarkable compassion for this servant, for the life of this servant, um, it's already giving us signs of the type of character that is, is present in this centurion. Now, it's not mentioned in Luke 7, but in the Matthew 8 account of this same miracle, it mentioned that the servant was sick with palsy uh, or you know, as we might say in modern medicine, cerebral palsy, which is an uncontrollable shaking, which means that, um, you know, maybe they were paralyzed, maybe they suffered from tremors, uh, maybe they suffered from seizures, but either way it goes, this person was sick and the centurion soldier wanted them healed. Did, did, didn't want to get rid of them, wanted to, um, wanted to get in contact with Jesus to see if Jesus could help out. And when he heard of Jesus... He sent unto him elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. So verse number three opens up with a very critical statement. It says that when the centurion heard of Jesus, uh, this is giving us an indication that he did not personally know Jesus or did hadn't personally witnessed the ministry of Jesus. He had simply heard of Jesus at this point and wanted to get in touch with Jesus and, and bid his, his, um, his ministry. You know, in, in Luke chapter four, verse four, uh, 37, it says, and when the fame of him, him being Jesus went out into every place of the country round about. So it's saying that the fame or the, the reputation of Jesus went out around the country, went out everywhere. So even though Jesus's ministry may have began in the city of Nazareth at this point, his, his reputation is preceding him. You know, Jesus started out preaching in synagogues and scripture says that he spoke as one having authority. And not only did he preach, but scripture says that he began to perform miracles. So, so the reputation of him having the miracle working power and preaching the word of God with authority it allowed his reputation to begin to expand. And now the centurion having heard of Jesus is saying, please, I need to get in touch with this, with this person so that they can come and heal my servant. So in his wisdom, the centurion soldier uh, sends Jewish leaders as proxy. And this is already saying a lot to the relations at that time. It's saying, first of all, that, says the, that the centurion soldier had a relationship, had interactions with the Jews. Um, it's also saying that clearly those interactions were healthy because why else would they be willing to, to go get Jesus on his behalf? You know, if they had a hostile relationship with him or if he was always mean to them, they probably wouldn't be prone to do something for him. But this is already giving clear signs that this centurion soldier had history with the Jews and it was a healthy history. Um, this is also showing that the Jewish leaders at this time had uh, a healthy relationship with Jesus, uh, which we know down the road that changes. <laughs> but at this time, in this point in Jesus's ministry, um, the Jewish leaders had a healthy relationship with him as well. So it says that he, he sends out for the Jewish leaders uh, to stand proxy between him and Jesus and just asking that Jesus would come and heal his servant. Now, the centurion soldier is already showing something critical in faith because he is already showing that he's imposing upon Jesus, asking him to do a miracle for somebody 
outside of the Jewish nation. So he's already saying that, look, you may be a Jew and you may be here for the Jews, but I'm asking you to step outside the bounds of that covenant relationship and be a blessing to me. So he's already showing remarkable faith in asking Jesus to do something for a Gentile, you know, and that's something that we have to, that we have to glean from, you know, scripture says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things, you know, we, we don't let what we know about God cause us to put God in a box, but what we know about God should give us the foundation to expect God for more. Amen. This this text that we're dealing with is a text that challenges faith. It speaks, it is a faith text that says, what are you believing God for? What are you trusting God for? Whatever you're thinking about God, expand your thinking because he's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ask or think. And the, the centurion soldier is showing us that when we, when we press on God, when we put our petitions out before God, even what we think we know about God, even the bounds that we think we know about God, God is God and God can do anything and God certainly has all power. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loved our nation and hath built us a synagogue. So in verses four and five, it's illustrating to us that the Jewish leaders uh, did in fact go and locate Jesus and begin to request asking him to come to the centurion and heal his servant. Uh, and it not only says that they went and got Jesus, it says that they are in a sense making a case for the centurion and compelling Jesus to come, trying to convince Jesus to come. And I think that what they're saying about him further lends to the fact that the centurion had a healthy relationship with them. What, what did they say? They, they said that he's worthy. Why? Because he loves the nation and he built a synagogue there in the city of Capernaum. Now, centurions, uh, Centurions had a higher level of commitment to the Roman military. The typical military uh, service term was 20 years. And what's challenging is that Roman soldiers often were not allowed to marry. So if a centurion, you know, agreed to become a centurion, they were making a very tremendous sacrifice and they were compensated financially for that. You know, centurions were often paid six to seven times that of a legionnaire. So they were, by all accounts, uh, very financially astute people, you know, if you will, because if, if you look at a legionnaire as maybe as a median income, if they were paid six to seven times that, they, they, they were paid very well. And what's clear is that this centurion put his wealth to a very remarkable use. He used it to be a blessing to the Jews there. And it says that he built a synagogue Please identify a synagogue versus a temple. The temple was a place where sacrifices were conducted. That was in the city of Jerusalem, but we're in the city of Capernaum. The, the synagogue would have just been a local place of worship where they would come together and they would preach the word of God in fellowship and corporate worship uh, on the on the Sabbath day or on, on in Jewish Shabbat. So um, it's it's interesting that he not only was a financial support, but it says that he loved their nation, which means that he had a respect for their religion. Uh, he, it, it would suggest that he was a devout man. Um, we're going to see evidence later, which I'm going to present the argument that he wasn't a proselyte. He wasn't a converted Jew. He, he wasn't that. Even though he clearly believes in God, and even though he clearly believes uh, in in the sanctity of the Jewish faith, he he wasn't all the way there yet. And one thing we need to keep in mind is that the Jewish leaders qualified him as worthy. You know that word worthy there. It means that. Uh, a person's character has come under examination. It, it, the definition literally lends to using scales to try to weigh someone's character or weigh their value. And when it's saying that he is worthy, it's saying that it's something based on his merit or something based on 
what he has done that accounts him as worthy and i think that that's very interesting because we're talking about a jewish faith that is based on works we never have to lose sight of the fact that jewish faith is a works based faith you are saved by works you are righteous by works you are counted as one of them by the works that you do and because of the works of the centurion soldier they said he's worthy and understand they're speaking positive of him but understand what made him worthy to the jews doesn't necessarily make somebody worthy in god's eyes because understand god wasn't after the works god was after the heart then jesus went with them and when he was now not far from the house the centurion sent friends to him saying unto him lord trouble not thyself for i am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof so in verse number six it's letting us know that jesus does respond to the request of the jewish leaders and he agrees with them to go back to the centurion's house uh, to help heal his servant. Uh, now, in the Matthew 8 account, it says that the centurion went to Jesus. And the conversation had uh, was between the centurion and Jesus, wherever Jesus was. But in the Luke 7 account, it's saying that the centurion sent Jewish leaders as proxy. And that Jesus was to you know come back to his house to perform this miracle. Now, in verse number four, the Jewish leader said, he's worthy. But the centurion's own account to himself in verse number six, he says, I am not worthy. When Jesus was on his way to his house, not far off, now he sends friends and says, please stop Jesus and let him know he doesn't need to come to my house because I am not worthy. Why is he saying that he's not worthy? Well, according to Jewish law, uh, a Gentile's house was considered unclean. So a Jew going into a Gentile's house would have made them unclean. This is a remarkable amount of respect and deference that the centurion is having for Jesus and saying, look, I understand the different protocols of your faith. And if you come into my house, you will be considered unclean. And he didn't want to, to Jesus to violate his faith. Now, in, in Leviticus, where are we getting that from? In Leviticus chapter 5, uh, verses uh, 2 through 3, we're not going to read it right now, but go back and read it when you got a chance. It, the, the Mosaic Law shows us that anytime you touch something that is unclean, you become unclean. Now, it doesn't explicitly say it in the Mosaic law that going into a Gentile's house makes you unclean, but the Jews have an additional uh, spiritual text to the Pentateuch. They just don't have the Mosaic law, um, but they have several religious texts, and one of them is called the Mishnah. And in the Mishnah, there is a rec record that says the dwelling places of non-Jews are unclean. So according to this, this section of the Jewish law, if a Jew goes into a Gentile's house, they would be considered unclean. So even though we don't see this explicitly written in the Christian Bible, there is illustrations of this law in practice throughout scripture. Where? Well, most notably in John chapter eight, verse number 28, it talks about that the Jews that arrested Jesus and took him from the high priest to uh, to Pontius Pilate's uh, house. It says that when they brought Jesus to his house, it says that they stood outside the, the judgment hall, or they stood outside Pontius' house. It says, why? It says, lest they be defiled. In John chapter 18, verse 28, it says that they stood outside, lest they be defiled defiled and they wouldn't be allowed to participate in the Passover. So this is Jews giving evidence of standing outside a Gentile's house. Uh, there's also an account in Acts chapter 10 
uh, it talks about when Cornelius asked Peter to come to his house and, and minister the gospel, Peter had reservations. Peter didn't want to go into Cornelius' house and Peter had to have a vision. And because of the vision that he had, Peter was given the, 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 the reassurance that it was okay for him to enter Cornelius' house. In Acts chapter 10, verse 28, it says, And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come uh, unto one another, come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So in other words, the vision that God had given Peter gave him the assurance that it was okay for him to go to Cornelius's house. And even though in times past, that would have considered uh, been a, a violation of the Jewish law. Peter at that point, of course, in Acts chapter 10, wasn't just a Jew, but he was a Judeo-Christian. He was one that had converted to Christianity. And we know Peter had a, had a really rough time uh, kind of just pulling down some of the liturgical and religious standards of the Jewish faith. That was often a bit of arguing between him and Paul, uh, and this was certain, certainly one of them. But either way it goes, Cornelius is saying that he is unworthy. He's telling Jesus, don't come into my house, don't violate Jewish law. It's also him being honest in saying that there's something about his house or something in his house that was a violation, you know, and this is why I made the argument earlier that he clearly wasn't a proselyte. He wasn't someone that had converted to Judaism because if he did, his house would have been clean. So since he wasn't clean, according to Jewish standards, he told Jesus, you, you don't have to come into my house. I think that there's something even more remarkable to pull out of this text. And it's found at the beginning part of, of, of verse six. It says, and Jesus went with them. Seems subtle, but Jesus went with them. It means that Jesus was willing to go into the centurion's house. Jesus was willing to break protocol in order to be a blessing, in order to demonstrate power, in order to show love. You know, this is something that Jesus did pretty consistently throughout his ministry. He did things that, that violated Jewish law, but he did it in an act of ministry in order to display love and compassion. And that's why he was constantly in, in arguments back and forth with the Pharisees because they would try to trip him up on, on the technicalities of the Jewish law. You know, Matthew chapter eight records that when Jesus was on his way into the city of Capernaum, that a man who had leprosy asked Jesus to heal him. According to the Mosaic law, touching anybody that had leprosy, you would be considered unclean. But scripture says in Matthew eight, that Jesus laid hands on the man that had leprosy touch that which was unclean in order to heal him. You know, scripture talks about in John chapter four that Jesus traveled through Samaria. He said, we need go through Samaria. Why? Because there was a Samaritan woman at the well that he needed to minister to. You know, according to Jewish practice, when they would travel from Galilee to Judea, they would travel around Samaria. Samaritans were half breeds. They were half Jewish and half pagan. And we don't have, they are unclean, but Jesus traveled through Samaria. Why? Because he needed to do ministry in Samaria. So this, there are several accounts, Jesus doing, you know, performing miracles on the Sabbath. They say you're doing work on the Sabbath, you know, several accounts of Jesus demonstrating his love. That's what Jesus is doing. That's, that's the type of God that we serve. He, he will demonstrate his love and he will do whatever it takes to reach us where we are. You know, scripture says in the book of Romans that God commended his love towards us and that he died for us. Now, some people have, might, might get hung up on the fact of what Jesus is doing, but you have to understand something that is critical of the character of God is that God can touch an unclean thing and that unclean thing become clean. See, when we as man, as humanity, when we touch the unclean thing, we become unclean 
according to the book of Leviticus. But we saw examples even in Isaiah chapter 6 when the coals were taken off the altar and placed on Isaiah's unclean lips, his unclean lips became clean. When that which is holy of God touches that which is unclean, the unclean becomes clean. And that is the difference between God and, and between the, the ministry of Jesus and, and these rules that would have otherwise restricted him according to the Jewish law. He was fully God and fully man. And when a fully God that is holy touches that which is unclean, it becomes clean. So it, it, and it's, just, it's just remarkable to, to, to just see how Jesus was willing he was willing to go to his house, even though they knew what was the, you know, the, the Jewish law at that time. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. All right. <laughs> so now with verses 7 and 8, we're really getting to, into some, some powerful conversations uh, between the centurion and Jesus. And he's really declaring some remarkable faith. Now, in verse 7, the centurion goes on to further clarify that not only is uh, he not worthy that Jesus come to his house, but he's saying, I'm not worthy to come to you again, you know, just out of respect for, for Jewish law and Jewish standards of cleanliness. He knew that there was something about him that would violate them. So he's saying, look, you can just speak a word from where you are and my servant can be healed. Now he goes on to verse number eight and he begins to explain himself. He begins to explain how does he have this remarkable faith? How does how does he have this perception of the power of God? Well, he says that I'm a man under authority. Now, in some translations of, of Luke 7 and 8, it says that he's a man under authority. And then he says, and a man of authority. So he's saying that as a centurion, uh, I have people that outrank me. I stand under authority. There are people that, that command cohorts and people in an emperor that would command the legion. So I stand under authority, but he's saying, but wait a minute. He says, I also stand of authority. I have, I have people under me. And he's saying, I tell these people to come and they come and I tell them to do and they do. I tell them to go and they go. And he is attributing the authority that he possesses in the natural. And he's saying, Jesus, you got that same authority in the spirit you got that same authority in, in, in the power of God, in the power of miracles. He's saying, you don't have to come where I am, but he's saying healing power, it follows your command. It's under God's authority. And I, I think that that's, that that's so amazing. That, that, that gives me so much hope. It gives me chills every time I think about it because he's telling God, he's saying, God, I see you. I see you in a way possibly that other people don't see you up to this point. You know, Jesus's ministry up to this point, everything had been in person. Everything that Jesus did, he either spoke over them in person or he laid hands on them. So the, 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 the concept of the miraculous power of Jesus traveling distances, he is really speaking to the God in Jesus. He is really saying, look, you're not just man. There's something more on the inside of you that to where that the power that's on the inside of you can transcend distances. Look, somebody needs to know that on tonight. You, you need to know that the prayers that you pray, it transcends distances. There is no distance that the power of God cannot go. You know, we sometimes we're praying for loved ones. We're, we're praying for friends. We're praying for people that are clear halfway around this world. But you know what? The power of God knows no bounds. It can travel distances. This is the faith that we have. This is the hope that we have. This is the faith that the centurion has in saying that Jesus, look, 
I've got a concept here and I, and I, I see who you are. And, and it's, it's such a, it's such, it's such a powerful statement because he's, I can imagine the Jews listening to what he's saying and being taken back. Like, wait a minute. What is, what is this guy saying? He's saying that Jesus has the power to demonstrate authority over a distance. He, he's saying something about Jesus that they're not even saying about Jesus. He, he's seeing Jesus in a way, you know, and sometimes I think about how sometimes we can be in church for so long that sometimes our expectation and our perception of Jesus gets confined to based on how we've seen God work. Yes, we believe God for miracles, but we've been in church for so long that maybe we get programmed and then somebody new gets saved. Somebody fresh off the street, doesn't know church protocol, may not know all of scripture, you know, may not know how to properly testify or sing the songs, but their faith is just that raw faith. And they're just believing God for anything. And because of that raw faith, God is able to move in their lives like he's never moved before. You know, I think back again to the woman at the well. And scripture says that after she had an encounter with Jesus, she went back and she testified. She just told everybody in the city, come see a man. She she didn't, she didn't think about the fact that she was a Samaritan and that Jesus was a Jew. She didn't think about the fact that she was a woman and maybe people don't want to listen to a woman. She didn't think about her reputation and how maybe she had multiple husbands and maybe people were thinking, who's this, who's your new man now? You know, she, all that stuff went out the door. She had raw faith because she was just had that fresh experience in God. And I can imagine, I can imagine this centurion soldier in that same position to where, look, I, I, I don't I don't know what all these Jewish leaders know. I just know I need something from God and I believe God is able. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. And they that were sent returning to the house found the servant whole that had been sick. So verse number nine is illustrating Jesus's response to what the centurion said in that he was a man of authority and under authority. And Jesus is taken back by his faith. It says that Jesus marveled. To to say that Jesus was marveled, it means that that he was astonished. Jesus was, was pleased and he was impressed by this man's faith. You know, when I read this, the, the God just started to convict me really in my spirit because I felt God speaking to me and saying, when is the last time your faith impressed God? When, when is the last time you had so much faith? Not See, sometimes we just want enough faith for God to hear our prayers. And sometimes we just want enough faith for God to answer our prayers. But do we go to a place where we're like, I need to have so much faith that God is impressed with my faith. That, that, see, scripture is very clear. It says without faith, it's impossible to please God. Our faith is what we offer God to satisfy God. That's, that's what God is after. You know, you, you could argue that this life is about trusting God. The, the whole concept of the word of God and the whole concept of how God has set up this, this reality uh, through, through his word is that God is trying to bring us to a place where we trust him. God is allowing us to go through experiences in life, whether good or bad, to show are you going to trust God? Are you going to have faith in God and not just have any old kind of faith in God, have a kind of faith that gets God's attention? You know, scripture is very clear in Luke chapter 18. It talks about in the second coming of Jesus, it says, will the son of man find faith? God is looking for faith because faith pleases him and make no mistake the experiences that we go through is God trying to pull the faith 
out of our lives. You know, sometimes we, we keep praying and we're like, God, deliver me from this situation. God, work a miracle. God, bring me out. God, take me through. And we don't understand that, yes, God has the power to do it. Yes, God can do it. But what is God after? God is after your faith. Paul prayed three times. Take this thorn out of my life. But God said, have faith, Paul. My grace is sufficient. It, it, it was the centurion's faith that got God's attention. You know, we are seeing so many elements of faith through this text. You know, first of all, the centurion had enough faith to believe that God's power would extend beyond the Jews. That was the first element of his faith. Second element of his faith is he believed that God's faith knew no distances. He said, you ain't got to come to my house. You ain't got to be in person. You ain't got to lay hands. Just stay where you are. And you can speak a word and your power will travel. There's another element to this that we haven't really discussed. We've been discussing this whole story from the perspective of the centurion. But there's another important character, the servant. Do you understand that it's showing us that faith can stand proxy? That How powerful is faith? It's, it's not saying that the servant had faith. It's not saying that the servant prayed. It's not saying that the servant believed in God and was requesting the attention of Jesus. It's not saying anything about the servant, but it's saying that because of the centurion's faith, it's saying that God worked a miracle proxy for someone. You know that ought to stir us. That ought that motivates us as believers because you know we've got family and loved ones. We've got people in our lives. We've got people that we encounter every single day that need the dynamic power of God. And can God move in their lives? Yes, he can. Because according to faith, God's power can move proxy. We can lay those petitions out before God and we can love our brother. We can love our sister. We can show concern about what's going on in their lives. And we can pray for them and God most certainly, he honors those prayers. You know, the, the scripture is, is so clear that if we can demonstrate faith to God, we can get something out of God that we would never expect. You know, there was another account in the book of Matthew of a Canaanite woman that came to Jesus and asked Jesus to deliver her daughter from a demonic spirit. And he said, it's not meat that I give the children's bread to dogs. But she said, even the dogs can eat the crumbs from the master's table. He's, she's, she's, she's showing the same faith that, that the centurion is showing and saying that I know you were sent to the Jews. But I know that your power can extend to the Gentiles. I know that your power can extend beyond what we've seen. God, I'm going to take the brakes off my expectations. God, I'm going to expand my expectations because you can truly do exceedingly and abundantly. God, I'm, gonna I'm just going to allow my faith to abound. There's, there's so much that we can believe God for. And I know God is able. I know that he's ready. And I know that God is willing and we can pray and we can put those petitions. I want, I want to encourage you and I want to challenge you and I'm, and I'm ending and I'm ending with this. You as a believer have the power to access the throne room of God. Use that power that God has given and pray on somebody's behalf. Minister in somebody else's life. Pray for yourself, but pray for others. Because what we're seeing in this text is that God didn't just heal the servant. Scripture says that he was made whole. That is a, a complete restoration of his life. We've got people. Listen, I got to go. I'm getting excited. We got people in our lives, unsaved loved ones, who not only need salvation, they need their lives restored. 
We got friends and loved ones that are behind bars. We got people that are bound by drugs. We got, we got people whose lives have been torn apart by the ups and downs of this life experiences. And you can pray and you can, you can go to Jesus on their behalf. And God can not only save them, God can make them whole. He's showing us in this passage that God's power can go wherever your faith can go. You've got to pray. And you got to put that stuff before God. And God is not a respecter of person. And just like he did it for this centurion, he'll do it for you. I want to thank you for tuning in to this episode of Just Teach. Our goal here is to simply encourage as many people as we can in the word of God. And certainly to spread the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ all around the world. We're asking you to support us in this effort by liking, by sharing, by subscribing, and certainly leave your comments in the comment section if you have any questions around the lesson. And if you have any prayer requests, we want to pray with you. We want to stand with you. Listen, we love you with the love of the Lord. We'll see you next time.